Good afternoon, everybody, um, and welcome to this uh, very last session of Play the Game uh, for this year, uh, apart from the important session, of course, we have this evening. Um, we, um, this session is about, um, and the contrary to many of the other sessions we have during this conference, something you should do. And uh, at least a lot of what is in this uh, is in this charter, the wonderful intentions, but how can they come true? And uh, that is, uh, it is a very important charter. You all had it in your the the draft for it in your delegate kit. Um, you should, if you haven't had time to read it, of course you will have an introduction now. I, I strongly recommend that you look through it because it is, as I see it, is very much a, a, a paper that all kinds of stakeholders can use to see what should we actually be doing. And as play the game, of course, we also think, for example, the media should take it and look what are our governments and sports organizations, what are they doing? Actually, that's also in the charter. And for play the game, it's always been a challenge to, we are, we are, we are very good at raising the questions of things you should not do, but we really, really want to also have this on the agenda. And that's also why we are very thankful that UNESCO uh, are here to discuss this charter. and. Uh, that's also why I can now hand over the, the floor to the first speaker of this session, which is uh, Philip, Philip uh, Müller-Wirt. Uh, he joined UNESCO in 1991, and um, he was uh, in 2013 when there was the first, uh, the fifth World Conference on for sports ministers. He was very much the, the focal point of that conference, and and there he has been heading this group, and that has been uh, drafting this. Uh, revised charter, and uh, it is not something that it, he's just been writing, I think, in, in five minutes. There's a lot of work bit, uh, behind it, so I think it's, I'll just give the floor to you to introduce us to the charter. Thank you very much. Uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I hope that after several days of controversial debate, we now enter into something a little more consensual, but maybe that is an unjustified hope. I would like to thank Jens Andersen and Play the Game for choosing this topic for the closing session of this year's conference and for allowing me to be here with you. Jens has been the co-author of the preliminary draft of the revised charter you have all with you, I hope, and you will know the quality of the text is uh, owed to him to a huge extent. Uh, but even more than his drafting skills and expertise, it's his strong commitment to this revision of the Charter that makes a real difference. The Charter, as we will see hopefully in the course of this session, can only live if champions like Jens and my five co-panelists uh, are committed to giving it a life. I just will explain to you a little UNESCO's role in sport. I'm not expecting everyone to know it. Uh, some people take us for the UN Children's Organization. No, we are not UNICEF. Others are mainly thinking of UNESCO in terms of world heritage. Uh, but UNESCO has a long-standing role in sport, which began in the mid-50s when we recognized the importance of physical education in the school curriculum and for a rounded education of young children and, and, and pupils as part of our educational mandate. And right now, we are rolling out a global a quality physical education policy project in several countries in the world uh, with the support from UNDP, WHO, UNICEF, IOC, XP and many others. So that role is still very, very active. In, the in 1976, uh, UNESCO organized the first World Conference of Sport Ministers. In 1978, we adopted the International Charter of Physical Education and Sport and established CGEPS a intergovernmental committee uh, on sport and physical education that not only gathers 18 member states of all regions of the world, but also the major sports organizations and NGOs and UN agencies. In 2005, finally, you've heard that in the prior presentation, UNESCO adopted the International Convention Against uh, Doping in Sport, which to date is the only binding international legal instruments in the area of sport integrity, and to some extent also in the area of sport governance. So UNESCO has a very distinct role in sports within the UN system. We could, without being too presumptuous, say we are the custodians of sport policy development and our uh, interlocutors in this domain are sport ministries. 
It was MINEPS 5 in 2013 that initiated the revision of the Charter in the Declaration of Berlin, adopted by 121 member states. The revision of this evidence-based international standard setting instrument, I use here the terms of our lawyers, has followed a number of formal steps with which I won't bother you here. But it should be noted that many member states, and in particular from the Latin American and Caribbean region, have pushed us to accelerate the revision process, which was, again, according to our lawyers, normally uh, foreseen for a five-year period. Now we are here two and a half years after Berlin, and I hope that uh, in two weeks, the General Conference of UNESCO, 195 member states, will adopt the revised charter, but you never can be sure. Sometimes discussions go around a semicolon for three hours and lose focus, and uh, that can sabotage a very uh, fragile exercise. However, the revised charter you have in front of you has been approved by the executive board, and that normally is a sort of warrant for its adoption by the General Conference. Now, the main amendments of the charter, the revised charter with respect to the original text, concern the introduction of the concept of physical activity, as well as the inclusion of the gender dimension throughout the charter. The original charter didn't address this dimension at all. Uh, it includes new principles concerning inclusivity, lifelong participation, safety, and sustainability. The longest article of the revised charter, as for the original charter, concerns the protection of the integrity of sport. While a specific article on the role of media of the original charter was removed, as it was considered too prescriptive, the revised charter invites the media to fulfill their role as critical and independent observers. Now the crucial question, what is the charter good for? I will try and address this question, but I hope the answers will come rather from the panelists than from me, from what we could call an international policy perspective. First, the Charter should mark a move away from mere declarations towards action, from policy intent to implementation. There is a unique consensus now formulated in this revised Charter of the essentials of sport policy. And we indeed, in the follow-up process to the MINEPS 5 conference, have noted in many member states and regions as saturations with declarations. The member states want to move on, and the question is no longer what should be done, but how should we do it? So the Article 12 of the Charter gives us a good indication of the how. Exchange of good practice, education and training programs, capacity development, advocacy, as well as indicators and other monitoring and evaluation tools. <coughs> Sorry. The next World Sport Conference of Sport Ministers will uh, focus, therefore, on the implementation and monitoring of the Declaration of Berlin, which is a new thing, never a MINEPS conference has looked back to what actually was decided in the previous one, and of the revised charter. Second, the charter should be used as a benchmark for a comprehensive vision of physical education, physical activity, and sport. This concerns in particular the connection between sport integrity and the individual and social benefits that sport can generate. Many, if not most, of UNESCO's member states do not consider the fight against doping, match fixing, corruptions, corruption and sports-related violations of human rights as a policy priority. The revised charter provides a framework that orients the protection of the integrity of sport towards the broader policy gains of grassroots sport. Concretely saying, if we go to member states and say, through sport, through grassroots sports, you can address health issues, but you have to look at doping issues in grassroots sports at the same time, this is much more of an incentive to member states than just saying you have to comply with international rules on doping, uh, against doping. So the clarification of the very purpose of international and national sport policy 
combined with the Charter's concept of sport as a public good, are a prerequisite for strengthening international cooperation for the protection of sport integrity. Third, the unique legitimacy of the revised Charter as the outcome of a multi-stakeholder consultation and hopefully the adoption by UNESCO's 195 member states positions the Charter as a powerful advocacy tool. No country in the world meets all the principles stated in the Charter with the notable exception of Denmark eventually. Um, although the Charter has, is only a soft standard, i.e. not legally binding, it provides legitimacy for different stakeholder groups fostering changes in sport policies at the national and international levels. I just mentioned the gender issue. A number of member states do obviously not comply with the provisions stated in the Charter on that issue, but the, uh, the lobby groups for gender equality in certain regions and countries can use the Charter to say, you have adopted these principles. The Charter affirms human rights-based principles that should set a baseline in the fight for gender equality, non-discrimination, inclusivity, and social inclusion. Last, the Charter places the sport policy debate where it should be first and foremost in the public domain. While there are some indications that some sports organizations recognize their social, if not political, role, too often their contribution to the debate focuses on autonomy. And this is a particular challenge in the revision of the Charter. The only controversial discussion was about the concept of sport autonomy. After a meeting which approved a draft of the Charter by the Intergovernmental Committee, and after consultations with expert organizations, including the International Olympic Committee, the following article was proposed to be included in the Charter. Public authorities must ensure that the freedom of association or sport organizations is respected and that no restrictions are placed on the exercise of, exercise of this right other than those which are prescribed by law and are necessary in a, demo <coughs> sorry, a democratic society. All stakeholders should recognize that sports organizations operate in a sphere of autonomy with respect to the free establishment and control of the rules of sport competitions, the determination of the structure and governance of their organizations, and the holding of elections free from any outside influence. This autonomy of sport is subject to the compliance with the general principles and international standards of good governance. Now, this article may sound better than what we have seen presented by Jonas on the independence and autonomy of sport in the UN resolution. However, our executive board refuted that any notion of autonomy of sport be included in the Charter. And what you have now is Article 10.8, which reads, public authorities and sports organizations are invited to enhance their cooperation in a spirit of mutual respect and to minimize the risk of conflict by clearly defining the respective functions, legal rights, and mutual responsibilities in physical education, physical activity, and sport. This is the UNESCO perspective on the autonomy of sport. To end, I have to say this is our common charter, and it will be only as useful as we will make it. Thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, now it's up to some of the other panelists to try to give us a perspective on their role and also, of course, their perspective from where they come from. And, and, and one of uh, the person who maybe is uh, living the charter every day is the next speaker. That's uh, Bob, Bob Monroe. He is the founder and chairman of the Matara Youth Sports Association, a pioneering self-help self -help youth sports for devel development project started in 1987 in uh, Nairobi. 
and they have over 30,000 youth participants in their in their programs, which is not just uh, sport. He's also the founder of uh, Matara United FC, which is uh, one of the best football clubs in Kenya, and in in this capacity, he's all, he has always also been one of the founders of of the Kenyan um, Premier League. Um, and then, if you look into the CV, there's a long, long list of awards that his project in Nairobi has got. And uh, I think it's just uh, too too many that I can mention them all. So I'll just give the floor to Bob Monroe. Thank you. The uh, two, two quick corrections to that introduction. There are 30,001 youth. I'm the oldest Mathara youth. So, and secondly, it's not his project. It's their project. The reason MISA has lasted for 30 years is because it's owned and run by the youth, and it really is. And I, uh, I'm the chairman of the board of trustees and uh, an advisor. Now. UNESCO Charter. I think I'm going to pick up where you left off because you said intent to action. How do we move from intent to action? If I had a title it says to be announced, it would be from aspiration to implementation. But maybe there's a little bit of history before that. I've worked in the UN for, in or for the UN for 45 years and uh, I've been involved in lots of meetings and lots of action plans, lots of declarations and lots of charters. And in fact, after 15 years, by the mid 80s, I'd been to over 200 international meetings. That's why I left the UN, because I found myself in meetings, exhilarating with ministers and prime ministers and ambassadors. But I found myself surrounded by diplomats solving problems by finding language around them. And when I realized that, that was the end of my career in those meetings. And that's why I moved to Africa and went on the front lines. There were just, did I want to spend the rest of my career being sort of finding verbal solutions to real world problems? And the, my answer was no, and that's why I went to Africa. So with that preface, actually, the UNESCO Charter is one of the good ones. I've gone through it thoroughly. It's, uh, it really says what it means. So I want to congratulate the, the authors and the editors, uh, some of whom are in this room, that it, it really shows a clear understanding and respect for the use of language, which you would expect from UNESCO. So that's the first characteristic of it. It's readable and there's a lot that aren't. So if it, if it says what it means, then the issue is, does it mean what it says? And that's the issue I'd like to address. It has a history. 1978 was the first one, then a slight revision in 91, and now this complete rethinking in 2014-2015. Uh, in it has very important additions. Uh, the section on integrity, and, uh, and it also has a rather un-UN addition as well, or approach, in that a lot of the shoulds are in this charter must, and that's also too rare in the United Nations. I, and this ad addition, of course, from my perspective and the youth in Mathari who are here as well, uh, the Sport for Development section, Article Number Eleven. But I have a couple. I have four questions I'd like uh, to be addressed as as part of this. Uh, so this is the this is the first revision. It was first done 37 years ago. Uh, what has been the impact of the other first charter in the last 37 years? Number two, uh, Sport for Development, Chapter 11, is a good addition. But Philip, it says should, not must, in that section. Why not? <laughs> Why should, instead of must? Third, how, how are you going to ensure that the, 
the must means must. Are you going to be doing? Uh, how, how are you going to encourage, support, stimulate, provoke uh, government implementation? MICE has existed for over 30 years. We have not got a single shilling of support from the government of Kenya, although we've been doing a lot of the things that are in this charter, uh, and we've been doing it when the government should be doing it. We've been doing a lot of those things for the government and yet had no support whatsoever. So how are you going to convert those musts uh, into action? A checklist, like the good governance observer, uh, uh, ranking of countries in a year from now or two years from now in terms of their compliance with uh, the provisions of the Charter. So I'd, I'd appreciate some guidance on that. Those are three uh, fairly straightforward pitches, which you can probably take a good hit at. Now comes the curveball. On the front of your document, it says, this document has no financial and administrative implications. So, if, you, if UNESCO is not going to make financial administrative commitments to this charter, how do you expect governments to do so? Thank you. Thank you, Bob. Uh, the next speaker uh, should also know a little bit about the youth, actually, because he has been uh, involved with the Roskilde Festival, which is one of the, is it the la largest music festival in, in Europe, or one of the largest for, for many years as head of development, as spokesman, as director of innovation. And um, since last year, he has been the, the director of uh, the Danish Foundation for Culture and Sports Facilities, and they're actually about developing innovative, creative facilities. But we gave him a little challenge because there's no doubt that he knows a lot about innovation. We said, but your foundation receives money from the lottery found they, uh, every year and you have money and you can go in and sometimes contribute to making the projects more expensive and, and better. <laughs> but uh, it is not every organization that has a privilege like that. So. We should also think about how to make it happen, maybe without a lot of uh, financial resources. So that was a little bit the challenge we gave to Espen, and uh, let's see if he's up to it. Hello, thank you for being able to be here. There's a Danish joke, uh, if you need to make a difference in the world, what the first thing we should do is to make a meeting. What do we talk about at that meeting? Something that somebody else should do. I don't know if you know that uh, and work by that. I think a lot of time that is basically the issue. So I will try to address what we can do if it's not a talk about having people to move and to do sports, but to do it. Basically, you should go home and make it, it possible for a few others to move, and then we had made a difference instead of just talking here. Please shift, if you can. I hand. Okay. Um, at first, if you look at facilities for sports, um, you use most of the money for the facilities for the audience. If you make a big stadium, it's where you really invest is for people to look at somebody else doing sports. So at first, if we should make a difference, we should try focus, do we really want people to participate or not? Right now, there is a little debate here locally in Aarhus with the biggest football club which wants a new stadium. I just saw in the, in the newspaper that they said football is the most important sport in Aarhus because we have most viewers in the television. So if the whole issue is that sport is important because many people can look at it, then I think we should try to change the perspective. So we should focus on what is fun, what is easy to do and what could we do everybody where we are coming from and develop from there. Go to your parking lot, use a lot of paint, and there you had, have the first facility for sports. This is just some examples, which is very, very easy to do. And if you see them running out there, it makes a big difference. Down in the corner is a field for bicycling. Um, and what is very funny here is that 
Every child would love to use them, but the adults didn't dare to. We only want to do sports if we have a complicated facilities with, with a lot of trainers and a lot of judges and a lot of tele television cameras. We should, to make a difference, make facilities that also makes the adults play and even play with their kids. That would be very funny and a lot of sports would go from there. If you look on the biggest trends right now in how to do sports, it's sports for a few people which are inspiring, which you can share on the social media and which is fun just to do right away instead of a lot of organizing. I'm sorry, not all these meetings. Then you have to make a facility simple, visible and fun. This is just a few examples. You could do it for playing football, you could do it for bicycling, you can do it for doing parkour or just having fun. Using all the techniques and experiences from computer gaming, you can of course do that in your daily life and ex it is extremely fun. Then you should have it, you should make it where you are in the daily life. On your road, on your walking path in the middle of the city. This is examples from mainly Copenhagen, where you can just use a lot of ropes, put it up in an old factory facility, and there you have an extremely funny and motivating playground that many, many people are using. And it's not expensive, Henrik. Of course, you can also have huge, impressive, this is some of the examples. In the corner is the Athletic Stadium, which just yesterday was announced as the world best um, stadium this year. Of course, you can go there and have great, great places where a lot of people want to go. But I think the most important ones, if you go home, take some paint, take off the parking lot and make a space for having a lot of fun. Thank you. Thank you for a short and uh, precise uh, presentation. Uh, our next speaker is uh, Hende Östtürk. She is uh, uh, an expert into sports law, working for, uh, as you can see, a law firm in, in Turkey. She is also involved in sport as a player, as a volunteer, as a, as a referee in the sport of, of basketball, and that, of course, also gives a perspective. Uh, and the question you can see from her presentation is not if but why strengthen women's access in sport and sports leadership? So over to you, Hande. Uh, thank you for the kind presentation um, introduction and I'm gonna try to stick to my time limit this time So uh, it's gonna be sounding like I'm repeating myself a little for those who were here for the previous session and I apologize for that um, I just want to give into um, give a couple of examples uh, I witnessed and some share some of my personal experiences and observations with you uh, So why strengthen women's access in sports and sports leadership? Well, I guess uh, all of us who are present here now, we agree that we should be uh, strengthening women's access to sports. I don't believe that there's one single soul here who would disagree. And so we kind of, all of us know why we should uh, improve women's involvement in sports. And I'm just going to share my personal take on that. Is um, As stated in the previous session, uh, first, yes, as individuals, women benefit a lot from being active in sports. And secondly, we believe that society has also a lot to benefit from once there are more women involved. And we discussed the corruption issue. And uh, I'd like to say, as women, for instance, who are uh, more active in sports and not only uh, at a professional level, but also amateur level, uh, they're likely to be more confident and more self-confident and more active in other their fields of their life and uh, on a daily life basis too and they're more likely to make better choices with their life because they feel more self-confident and more independent and this is very important maybe not in in a society where gender equal gender inequality is not as big of an issue as it is in uh, other countries like mine unfortunately and it's getting a, a, even a more important issue lately uh, which is kind of a su surprise because you would expect the societies to go forward not behind but um, so unfortunately in this case 
I can say um, I was working with uh, this association, National Association established, and um, board members were all women active in sports, and many were, were previous professional athletes. Uh, so this association aimed at getting uh, reaching to underprivileged women and children and get them more involved in sports. And while during our uh, researches and studies, and we were of, of course brainstorming how and why we should be getting uh, these women and people involved in sports, uh, we exchanged ideas and we came to the co conclusion with the fact that uh, women, especially who come from underclass rather than the rich, uh, those from rich uh, families, they have less access to um, money, less access to equal treatment in the society because where they're coming from, it's more common practice to look down on to those women. So, of course, it's hard for them to uh, face these prejudices and face these challenges and overcome them and say, I want to practice sport because if a husband says, what are you going to do uh, and running uh, along the river? What do you need to do sports? Because sports is not, first of all, it's not culturally seen as a fundamental human right. And secondly, even if it's a fundamental human rights, it's only for men because women are considered to be second class. So as a woman, your main duty is to take care of your family and provide for them not financially, but uh, sometimes even financially. So when you have to be staying home and in charge taking care of your kids and your husband, uh, how can you s take steal some of those time and spend it on your own pleasure only? So this is not very well accepted in uh, especially lower uh, income uh, families. And I believe through these associations uh, or through this cooperation, cooperative uh, facilities, if you get more women involved, it's going to also change the perspective. Uh, it's also going to change the perception of those men vis-a-vis uh, -vis their women. Because no matter how much old they are, or no matter how much they believe that women should stay home and do not get involved in sports, they respect those that are more active, uh, more than that are less active. So. They complain a lot about women getting involved in sports, but once women are more involved in sports, they're going to be much more respected, even from those men who believe that gender equality should not be enforced. So I believe that's one thing. And also th those women are going to be uh, more empowered and uh, they're going to be more self-confident to make their own choices, which is also good. And those are the people who raise the kids. And traditionally, especially in those uh, families, they have more impact on the children than the husband, than the father. So if the mo woman herself is more involved in supports and find more strength in herself uh, as a more active, uh, you know, uh, person in a society, societal life, then it's probably going to change the perceptive uh, perception of the kids towards women, which is a good thing, especially for uh, upcoming generations. And secondly, um, while we were, I was also working, uh, I was also at this conference uh, hosted by IAPESCOVA. Maybe some of you have heard of uh, the association, it's International Association of uh, physical education and sports for uh, girls and women. And one of the conferences was hosted in Turkey. And um, we were discussing uh, whether it is enough for women to get involved in sports and whether we should be doing anything to get them involved in at any cost. Well, uh, many, uh, many participants agreed with the proposition. I disagreed. And um, here is why. They were like offering, for instance, if especially in more conservative countries and societies, if women are afraid of going to mixed gyms and they don't want to expose their body to men and stuff, it might be a good idea to segregate the pools and the fitness centers and stuff. I disagree because honestly, it might be um, it might not have a, a downside to it in Canada or I don't know Norway, Denmark. It will definitely have a, a downside in uh, more conservative societies. For instance, Tunisia, Turkey. So if you segregate the fitness centers uh, just so that women could do sports, you're eventually you're going to segregate men and women. And I don't believe it contributes uh, any more to the equality of genders than women staying home. Because I believe, yeah, women should have an access to sports, but it also has to serve the purpose, which is to establish gender equality. So if you're going to just like push the women out of the society by themselves, they're hanging by themselves, they're going to pull, and they're far away from men, I don't think it's going to contribute to that any more than uh, you know, them not doing sports at all. So I believe 
believe that we should be uh, trying to find a system which uh, brings men and women and little uh, boys and little girls together so they're used to being together. Uh, this might sound very strange to some of you and many of you maybe. You might not even get your head around the idea, but I assure you that's, uh, that's a big issue in, um, unfortunately, my country. Little girls, even like nine years olders, uh, depending on their social status, of course, and the kind of family they're coming from, they're not even uh, they're not even welcomed in shorts and short sleeves. Why? Because they're women, and that might be inviting to some men. So you know how important it is to put the little boys and girls together and make them uh, play together, because then boys are going to respect their partners more, and they're gonna uh, they're not going to see them as a you know uh, another another. Uh, creature, but rather like an equal part, equal uh, but different part. So I think it's important that they start playing together uh, from the little ages and then they continue that way. And I think it's also important, uh, what, what one of these, um, I was actually National Olympic Committee member, I was talking to her and she said, the reason I support little girls to do sports is sometimes only so that they will be able to wear shorts in front of the public. That's ridiculous. But that sometimes is something we have to consider. That's very sad, but that's true. So when you have that uh, as a societal context, you can't offer people, let's just uh, divide gyms in two, and then you're never gonna see each other because that's gonna lead to something else where we don't wanna end up. So I believe like being together is important and uh, at that point, I also believe that gender, uh, mixed gender teams and mixed gender sports is something uh, that's really valuable. My personal observation is that for instance, wheelchair basketball teams have uh, males and females playing on the team. Uh, and also, of course, there's korfball, there are other sports that we talked about. I think those are very important because one uh, one of the disadvantages of the sport is that it's based so much on physical performance. Uh, it is that it almost makes it look like uh, women are less equal than men, as George Orwell would say. So the sport is so much about physical performance and naturally men are more capable of performing higher, then it would create the idea that, yes, yeah, see, men are more powerful, ergo men and women are not equal. So I believe like this mixed gender teams is also a good way to uh, overcome that uh, idea in that might occur in some archaic minds, unfortunately. So when I see the mixed uh, gender wheelchair basketball teams, for instance, I observe that the team members, they respect each other more and none of them really realizes whether, uh, whether um, one of the number nine is a woman or a man. They just consider her as a team member and I think it's a good start enough. So I believe that's also a good thing. And um, thirdly, I also think that um, if we include women in a, as a board member in the federations or uh, in positions where they can uh, be uh, de de decision makers uh, that would also increase the respect that we have for women and that's important for um, a better society, better functioning society. Yes, it's important for them because they, as individuals they have rights, but as a society we would also be at, um, I think, at a better place having men and women working together and equally. So if we uh, have more, more women involved in uh, higher rank positions, uh, I think that would also help us to uh, reach us uh, reach our goal. And in that, uh, with that note, I would like to emphasize that, for instance, there are so many female athletes uh, nowadays, which is good than uh, nothing. But uh, there are not as many, let's say, coaches, female coaches, female referees, female uh, board members, and. In maybe female, for female sports, like female soccer, there's a female coach, and female basketball, there's a female coach and female referee, which is also good, but it's not enough. And I think it also uh, poses a potential threat that sometimes, for instance, FIBA, I know because I'm a basketball referee, FIBA is pushing to have more female referees, which is great. But sometimes in order to establish it, they just keep delegating female referees to female games. And it creates a female-only atmosphere. And I think it's also scary enough, especially for countries like mine and people with the background 
uh, similar to mine. So I'm afraid that it's going to create a female-only atmosphere and females are not going to be able to officiate men's games or they're not going to be able to coach men's teams. And in theory, they are now able to do that. But even in practice right now, uh, it's not very common. So when I uh, was at FIBA camp this summer, uh, I met this FIBA... Um, uh, FIBA official and we were chatting and he was like saying don't worry this is temporary we're just trying to uh, increase the number of the female referees and when you reach when you guys reach a certain level then you're going to be uh, having more opportunity to uh, officiate top men's leagues and stuff uh, I hope that's the case uh, because I believe officiate women officiating women's teams for instance and women coaches uh, coaching women's teams is not enough because it's not going to help uh, create the idea of equality in men's ideas and we are not suffering from what other women are thinking of us we're not suffering from their perception we're mostly suffering from male perception and mostly because of the male dominated society so that's why we believe to we are uh, we need to work with men we need to sometimes it's hard because they have not all men obviously but some of them have like prejudices set in their mind and believe that a oh, woman can't do sports or a woman can't call, make good calls. Woman can't coach, especially not a male team. So first, we have this, we have these prejudices, but we have to face it without facing it, without living through it, without experiencing it. We're never going to be given a chance to overcome it. So even if it's hard in the first. I believe it's a process that we have to go through. And when I first started refing uh, men's league, uh, some of the coaches were even very honest with me. Thank God they were saying, oh, woman referee, now. And I'm like, uh, so what's wrong with woman referee? Ah, oh, you know, we don't like women referees. And they just have the, in their minds that you are potentially not uh, up to officiate that game. So obviously you're gonna experience that, but if you keep insisting on involving women in men's leagues and uh, where men's are, um, men's leagues and men's, uh, with men's coaches and stuff, at some point it's gonna end. Because at some point, you're gonna, we're gonna prove that we're good enough, and at some point men are gonna come around. So I believe it's also important, and it's, uh, it's important, and it has an impact on their private life too, because I see that if uh, I have a good game, I can see through the coach's eyes, uh, even if he's coming from a different uh, mindset from mine, I can see through his coach, uh, the coach's eyes that, okay, well, uh, women are usually incapable, but this one is an exception. Maybe I will be considered as an exception first, maybe for the second time. But after a while, he will stop thinking that way. And I think uh, with the players, we have a better... Um, Nowadays, we have a better uh, going on because they are more open than the coaches. They just focus on their game rather than playing with the referees and stuff. So as long as you're doing your job good, they don't really mess around with you. And I think it's also very good that they get, they get more used to the females being with them. And also because you're in a, a decision maker position, so you're, you have a authority over them. And I think it's also important that it's not only women who are ruled by men, but it can also be sometimes men who are ruled by women and who have to obey with the decisions that, uh, say, a female, uh, um, female referee. And I think it uh, contributes to the idea that depends on the context, we are equal and like sometimes I can be the ruler and you can be the ruler. And otherwise it's just going to be men ruling men and women ruling women. And um, I just believe in a bigger context, uh, if we have more women, especially involved in the higher positions, uh, that's going to change the individual's opinions and a while later society, hopefully, to the better. And even without realizing it, they're just going to get used to it. It's, they're not going to feeling, they're not going to be weirded out by a female referee. They're not going to be weirded out by a nine-year-old wearing short-sleeved uh, t-shirts. They're not going to be weirded out a boy and a girl uh, playing together against each other, and especially soccer, for instance, a uh, traditional male sport. And they're not going to be weirded out by this stuff. And if they're not going to be weirded out this stuff, they're going to be more tolerant of other issues as well. So that's my uh, take on this. And um, I would, of course, be more than happy to hear your take in, uh, after this session. So thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Hande. The next speaker is uh, a person who uh, has uh, 
set and who is taking the upon him to make a lot of more people active in sport because it's the president of the International Sports and Culture Association. They have set some specific targets of making more people active or helping making people more active. And uh, Mons Kirkeby also has capacities in Danish sport uh, and recreation. He's a board member of DDI, one of the founders of Play the Game, and he's also a board member of the Danish Outdoor Council. Please, Mons. Thank you very much. Uh, at this time of day, I would like to give a very listener-friendly presentation. It will be short. And uh, you have to read it from left to right. And uh, the key words are eating an elephant, financial or fan power, success but not solution, and play the game versus change the game. And I allow myself to take a little bit of a walk back in the history of play the game, because uh, I could speak about a convention, uh, I could speak about the new convention uh, from uh, various institutions, and uh, I will touch upon it, but uh, I would rather speak about some of the systemic uh, errors and challenges we have. So you read these uh, slides from left to right. Uh, we have a playing field called challenge identification, and in the middle you have a gray zone. It's not in particular uh, reason that it's gray, but it's not white. And on the other side, it's what we're all aiming for, a better world, a better sports world. In the history of play the game, uh, we have had some uh, topics, but uh, some question, uh, one question that comes back to me all the time is, actually, how do we accept uh, the changes, the speed of changes? So the question, how slow development? Do we accept without changing our strategy fundamentally? I don't think that uh, charters, conventions, strategies, codes are shaking the world. It might be in between reform and revolution, but it needs uh, legs to run on, and I will discuss a little bit that. I will also misuse two quotes from a person who was here a couple of days ago, Herman Ram, director of the anti doping Agency of the Netherlands, he said, uh, we do not need more guidelines and codes, we need implementation. And uh, being an operational director in the field of combating doping uh, and operating from we have to do something to knowing we will never solve the problem 100%, uh, he commented on that saying, we have to eat the elephant one piece at a time. Uh, in the history of play the game, we have had uh, several headlines and uh, thematic uh, areas, and I think uh, doping, corruption, inactivity, and match fixing are covering quite a few of them. Uh, so these are challenge, uh, identification challenges for us to reach the right side of the slide here. Uh, we have also within play the game institution and community which you are part of had some actions, and I think the headlines of these actions are revealing advocacy and climbing agendas. And uh, in this playing field, uh, with great success, you can pat yourself on the back or your friend next door or next, uh, next to you, because uh, there has been a lot of revealing, there has been a lot of uh, agenda setting and advocacy. And if you take the, the four areas of identification, the, the newest kid on the block, match fixing, had rocketed on the agendas, and within very few years, uh, it's something that's on everybody's agenda. Uh, just a small piece on this, uh, because this is our uh, main area in the challenge action, uh, besides trying to assist uh, doers to mobilize uh, the advocacy, we believe, to some extent, advocacy is a precondition for fast action. Uh, there seems to be some tendency in today's political advocacy, that is, if you can transform your message into financial numbers, then you have a stronger message. And actually, uh, quite a few of the topics of Play the Game over the time has done the same. Uh, doping, uh, we have figures on illegal drugs turnover, Corruption, the amount of bribery is a good talking point, starting point for advocacy. Match fixing, uh, although I know from the award-winning 
uh, play the game award-winning expert Declan Hill. He's reluctant to use to use figures. He wants to be on solid ground, but although he's reluctant, I know from others in the business of mass fiction, also in the business of combating mass, fi mass fiction, are using uh, figures to build their case. It's the same for me. I'm in activity, combat, or promoting physical activity, and we of course also use uh, cost dimension uh, to build the case. Just recently we asked the Center for Economic and Business Research in London to give us a figure, the cost figure, of inactivity in the 28 European countries belonging to what we call the European Union. The total figure, 80 billion euros per year, attributes to these five diseases. And that is maybe a very conservative figure because there are other diseases like muscle and skeleton diseases that also are very costly. So these are the costs. And of course, in our advocacy process, we also try to put a human dimension on it. So we put this number, or we have this number, that uh, inactivity is a killer too. And uh, it's uh, 500,000 deaths in Europe uh, caused by not moving enough. So of course, with these two uh, figures, 80 billion euro, 500,000 deaths, we put forward our case saying that there is a financial, ethical, and moral obligation to do something. Parallel to the life of Play the Game and the organization that I, that I represent, uh, there has been other actions. Maybe some of the action has been due to what is done by Play the Game, but nevertheless parallel. There has been charters, convention, codes and strategy, UNESCO charter, we have a draft here, Council of Europe conventions, there are several, a water code, been a long talk on that last two days, and just last uh, month, the 53 European countries of the World Health Organization adopted the first physical activity strategy. As you can see, we are still on the left side of the slide. And this is, for me, indicating some of the systemic barrier we have. We are successful. Play the game, institution and community is very successful in agenda setting, revealing and advocacy. But this is not the same as we have solved the problem. And unfortunately, I would say, uh, even though that there are some preconditions, can be a precondition to have conventions, to have codes, to have strategies, it is not directly linked to uh, solving the problem or changing the game. What is then uh, critical for changing the game? I think the most obvious now is that the conventions, the advocacy and everything else that is done to climate agendas need some infrastructure for change. That's also a very soft term, so what do we really mean here is maybe more precisely some political and organizational infrastructure. It's easier, it's easy to say what it is. It can be very different in Latin America where they might use the new UNESCO charter differently than in Russia or Western Europe. But for sure, the, the ideas, the codes needs not only to change from should to must, can, or may, but they actually need legs to run, and that is not necessarily coming from the governments, maybe they're coming from Matara United and others like them. What is our assets if we want to build a new uh, system for making change of a game? I think we have two assets. We have the 2% financial asset and the 50% fan asset. The 2% financial asset is uh, a couple of years ago there was a study on what do a wider definition of sport represent in GDP. It is a little bit above 2%, so it means that, for example, in the European Union, the turnover, the GDP of sport is a little bit higher than 2%, and that is equivalent to agriculture, fishing, and forestry together. This is a little surprise for many that it's so big. So I think here's an asset. 
The other asset is uh, the, what I would call the 50% fan asset. I think it's relevant or we can say that around 50% of uh, populations are fans. They're either fan by being a participant, active in physical activity or sport, or, and that is of course the biggest part, maybe 40% in average. The last part are the spectator fans, but all of them are fan of this uh, world of sport. Maybe also a comment on the 2% before we think that everything here is uh, bribery, uh, laundry. Uh, these are official uh, whitewashed or at least white money. Uh, and most of the GDP and turnover of the 2% comes from participation. That's you and me buying shoes or paying fee to the fitness center, whatever it does. And uh, a smaller part, of course, is for, from the fans who are watching. We're still not uh, really uh, entering the right side of this uh, slide here, and I think we still have a, a game to change. Uh, in the playing field of advocacy, we're doing good. We are not there yet on creating the sustainable infrastructure for uh, mobilization. And uh, these are the questions, so this are, is a question for me, from me to you. If you have the answer, I'm here all night. And uh, for sure, it's a systemic barrier. And unfortunately, a code, convention, a charter, a strategy can only be a little assistant. We will try to utilize them as much as possible, but they are not solving our world tomorrow. So uh, let's see how we can handle it. I don't think it's reform. It's not a revolution, but for sure we need significant change of our strategy. If we don't, maybe I'm giving a little, hopefully a little food for thought here, but if you don't like this menu, there's always the other way, and that is to do it the ram way. Try to eat the elephant with one piece at a time. But that is a long journey. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, our last panelist is uh, Richard, Bailey, ba Richard Bailey, who uh, represents ICSPE at this conference. is former university professor and head of department in the UK. He has written a long range of books, and uh, the last one uh, he was involved in, I guess it was the last one, I don't know, uh, not the latest one, I think is the right word, is, uh, was a book that just came out recently, Elite Sport and Sport for All, Bridging the Two Cultures and the Oh, um, editor there was uh, Margaret Talbot, who unfortunately passed away as she was here last year. So um, I will just pay a little tribute to her by and Richard Bailey. It's up to you. Right. Um, yes, as you say, Margaret co-edited that book with me and passed away um, halfway through the editing process, but um, really delighted that a number of the contributors to that book are actually in this room. So, uh, <laughs> hi everyone, I really appreciate it. Um, yeah, so I'm, uh, I'm a researcher and uh, it's an interesting, it's an interesting phenomenon, I think, uh, research in conversation with policy in conversation with practice, I mean, if you're if you're a policymaker uh, like Philip here, um, the trying to implement your your policy on the ground is is nightmarish. Um, think of the the poor researcher, because we we're one step further uh, further back still. So I thought when I was thinking about what to do, uh, what to talk to you about today, I basically have two topics of conversation. Uh, one of them is research, and then the other, um, as my office mate will tell you, is how the English invented everything. Um, well, actually, not everything, just everything good. Uh, so uh, I thought possibly that might start to become tedious. Uh, I could, for example, point out that uh, Jens's hero, Hamlet, was, of course, invented in England. Um, but I wouldn't do that because that would become, uh, become rather tedious. Uh, George Orwell, oh, not a week ago. 
Uh, so what I thought I'd talk about is, is the role of, of research within this policy process. And I was involved with the UNESCO Charter uh, from the, the uh, well, actually, really from the before the beginning. Uh, and, and it's interesting if you think about the, the role that research plays in this context, because I'm, in my perspective, from my perspective, this is the first charter, certainly, that I've been involved with or even read that in any serious way attempted to integrate research into uh, the documentation. The history of research and policy making, I think, can be summarised as three stages. Stage one, probably Plato, possibly before, um, up to about 15 years ago. Um, that was essentially common sense. Well, it's obvious. It's obvious that sport does this, physical activity does this. Plato, you may know in the Republic, argued that um, sport stopped boys, because in ancient Greek, girls hadn't been invented. Um, st sport stops boys from becoming soft and weak. Mathematics soft stops them from becoming thuggish. So uh, math if you study mathematics and sport, which is what you studied, wasn't it? Uh, um, then you're kind of the perfect person. Then about 15 years ago, there was the rise of evidence-based practice. Uh, that was associated, I mean, nationally and internationally by Tony Blair. Uh, not everything good comes from England. Um, but Tony Blair um, launched this concept of evidence-based practice. I apologise. Evidence-based practice. Now, as I understand it, that's evidence-based practice in the sense of common sense but using words like evidence and based and practice. Uh, we could call it diet evidence-based practice or evidence-based practice light. I can't believe it's not evidence-based practice. Because in pra if you actually look at what happened during that era, um, the, the actual influence of evidence was uh, minimal on, on actually what was happening in the real world, although the investment in research was substantial. So there's a really fascinating question about what actually happened to this research. Where did it go? I mean, certainly, if you look at youth sport within the context of England, um, it's probably somewhere in the region of six to ten million pounds was invested in researching youth sport. Where did it go? What happened? Because it certainly didn't have any impact on the practice that was taking place in schools. On the contrary. And then, recently, a more comprehensive version of evidence-based practice has started to come through. And, and it generally was the case with the Charter that we did look at the strength of evidence in the sense of, if you look at um, things like meta-analysis and systematic reviews for all of their strengths and weaknesses, an effort is made not just to say what's being claimed, what's being found out, but also how consistent is that evidence, how quantitative is it, how numerous is it, how relevant is it, and so on. So without, um, uh, without foreshadowing the discussion later on, of course I know why sports development is, uh, is should rather than must, because it's that it, one of those areas that is significantly underfunded in research, as is physical education, as is sports coaching, as is a whole host of areas, the, virtually the whole of the social science of sport, are considerably underfunded. So the evidence base for these types of areas, like sports development, is really massively out of balance with the evidence base, for example, from uh, medicine and things like that. But there were conversations, genuine conversations, about the evidence base. Do I use a clicker for this? Shall it work, do you think? Oh, who'd have thought? As you might, um, with regard to research and policy, there are some things that should never go together, it seems to me. Uh, when I was driving around the English countryside, um, I saw this and I just thought, well, that's an accident waiting to happen, isn't it? I mean, if they never seen Spider-Man, nonetheless. And I sometimes think, when I talk to my fellow, or previous academics, they got this sense that um, policy makers if not the enemy, have got kind of the moral character of a gangster. They're kind of like set blatter, but without the charm. Um, if you want, you know, th there's this real view that we just don't touch that type of thing. Heaven forbid we actually deal with real people. Well, 
that's got to change, isn't it? I mean, I don't, there, there seems to be, uh, among many of my colleagues, a view that somehow uh, they have a job as a matter of right, no matter how useful it is, no matter how it affects the world. Well, I think that view has to change. I mean, it's grossly arrogant, grossly ignorant. Um, and, and in fact, if you, know, if you really, it seems to me, as many of the people here in this room would, would say, if you genuinely believe in the power of sport to change lives, we've got to seriously start looking at mechanisms for communicating that at every level. And the truth is we don't. We don't do it very effectively at all. Um, this is a quotation I wheel out every now and again. Quotation, by the way. Quote is a noun. Quotation. Uh, sorry, quote is a verb. Chesh uh, Cheshire Puss, she began rather timidly, as she did not at all know whether it would be like the name. However, it only, it only grinned a little gr uh, wider. Come, it's pleased so far, thought Alice, and she went on. Would you tell me, please, which way I ought to go from here? That depends a good deal on where, where you want to get to, said the cat. I don't care much. Oh, sorry, I don't much care, said Alice. Then it doesn't matter which way you go, said the cat. So long as I get somewhere, Alice added as an explanation. Oh, you're sure to do that, said the cat, if only you walk long enough. Uh, it seems to me in a nutshell that's international policy and sport. Uh, it doesn't really matter where you go historically. As long as you just keep doing something, you'll get somewhere in the end. Well, we can't carry on like this. You know, there are real problems. The, the ICSPA um, information about the financial costs of uh, inactivity are alarming. But, of course, the financial costs are simply one manifestation of the lost lives as a result of physical inactivity. These things are becoming serious. The gender um, imbalance in sport in some countries is unaffected since the time of the first charter. Completely unaffected since the time of the last charter. That's not good enough. Change has to happen. So it seems to me about time that we start to say, which way do we go? And we become fellow travelers, traveling together, moving towards a shared goal. And if, we only, if we're gonna do that, we've got to start understanding each other's areas. So this is what I'm gonna be talking about, the vision I've talked a little briefly about that already. A few models of understanding. Just if you're journalists or policymakers or normal, useful people, you probably need to understand a little bit about how models of policy, research, interaction work. Outline a few basic problems and then offer, I'll, well, I'll solve the problem for you. So as I said, Tony Blair's government um, kind of launched this concept of evidence-based practice. David Blunkett talked about good government being thinking government. The irony is David Blunkett is probably the politician most associated with ignoring evidence um, in that government. He was Secretary of State for Education, um, and, in an and I'm not saying this in a particularly political way, although obviously I'm attacking a politician, so implicitly I am. Um, the, the enormous amount of funding in education uh, was not related to, to practice. I'll give you one particular example, nothing to do with sport. Um, all children in England now have to um, suffer a process called synthetic phonics, where the language is broken up into little bits of sound. Um, as far as I can see, not one single researcher in the world believes that's how you learn how to read. Uh, doesn't matter. It seems plausible. Bang! Policy for literacy. When uh, the Labour, Labour government ended, they were replaced by another evidence-based government, the Conservative government, and Secretary of State Michael Gove said on day one um, that we are going to have an evidence-based uh, policy in education and sport and physical education. On day two, he scrapped the most successful physical activity programme in the country and gave us specific guidance for schools to promote competitive, score, competitive sport. Despite the surveys, repeatedly num the repeated number of surveys and studies that say that an overemphasis on competitive sport is the main reason that children drop out of physical activity. Physical activity, policy-based practice, gone. Okay. Hopefully it's all right. So I don't seem to be able to use my fingers at the moment. Let's see. So in a nutshell, I mean, these are some of the ways that evidence is supposed to be related to policy. If you use the guidance of the, the governments, uh, this is actually based on the UK and German governments. So it's, it's a very sciencey view of research, repeated tests, counterfactual. So if we introduce the International Charter, we've got certain aspirations. What would happen if we don't introduce the International Charter? What would happen then? Because what have we got to compare it with? 
And then there's some measure of impact. What would it be like? If you've got no measure of impact, how do you know it's had an effect? Now, in practice, that's a very blunt tool, because how do you measure such things? Normally, what you do is you measure the effects of the intervention. So, if you want to, of course, synthetic phonics works in literacy, because you test synthetic phonics. Bang, evidence, wonderful. It's a very blunt tool, but it, it's a type of evidence. What's wrong with this thing? So, how can it relate to uh, research, relate to policy, relate to practice? The, the ideal, one of the ideals is what's called the interactive model, where policy gonks, as they're called, and researchers get in a room together and have a conversation. Now, if that's blindingly obvious to you, you might want to wonder, why does that hardly ever happen then? Because it really, really doesn't. What else happens? The knowledge-driven one. Research generates some findings and it demands a policy, possibly smoking, possibly. There may be people in the room that say, I'm a naive fool for believing it was so simple, but the evidence about 50 years ago onwards amassed of the um, health costs of smoking and uh, in one or another, it dr there's some association with it driving through change. Now, researchers, I mean, that's almost platonic, isn't it? Philosopher kings saying, we've got the knowledge and we demand action. Wouldn't it be great if, like, professors ruled the world? It would just be fabulous. Yeah, Peter agrees. You've definitely thought about that before. Um, the political model is where you, you use research findings. Now, this is extremely common, where governments need evidence. So they will look around. Now, as you may know, if you need evidence for anything, you will find it. If you believe in homeopathy, and you're an idiot, but if you believe in homeopathy, you will find publications in favour of homeopathy. If you believe in wristbands that have a holographic chip that synchronise with your brain and improve performance, you'd be an idiot, but you will find ev evidence of some sort to support it. This is extremely common, and you will find academics willing to do the study if you pay them high um, enough. This is the tactical model, where research is used to offer, if you like, to bolster the case. So we've decided to do it anyway, but we know that the government or the treasury or the finance department will say, and where's the evidence? So you use it tactically. Again, you've decided the question, you've decided the answer, but you use the research simply to support your case. These are the two, by the, the ones in grey, by the way, are standard policy, docu uh, policy literature. The ones in red are my own contributions. The obligation model. There is an expectation that some sort of research, no matter how marginally related to the policy, takes place. So, for example, according to the UK government, although I live in Germany, I'm, um, most of my work was in the UK, 10% um, of all public expenditure should be associated with research and evaluation. Now, the problem with that is that the research and evaluation might prove quite awkward if they come up with the wrong answer. So, essentially, what happens in increasingly in the UK, or what did happen in the UK, is that people are commissioned to do irrelevant research. In other words, you can say, look, we've spent the money, but the likelihood of the research actually damaging your, your um, political or tactical argument is minimal. And then there's the vanity model. Research is used to highlight the scientific sexiness of the policy. Uh, we see this a lot in, uh, in governments where um, certain research, particularly neuroscientific research, uh, things like nudge, behavioural economics, and so on, is, is used, is scattered like, um, like a, a fondant on top of the policy cake, just to make it look a little bit more sexy, a little bit more attractive. Um, oh, you've got brain science. That must be good. Some problems. Simply put, there are three types of problems. Problems related to research, problems related to the policy making, and problems with, to do with the interaction. The, the biggest problem with, to do with research is that academics on the whole are rubbish at communicating their research to the wider audience. Is that true? Yeah, okay. Don't even pretend that it isn't. 
some of the academics, I don't know what you're talking about. It is, trust me. I thought I was a, I thought I was a good writer. I write professionally. When I tried to write for a, a mass market, I found it extremely difficult, extremely difficult. I was not in any way skilled. Um, and, that's and I've actually been properly educated. Some of the next generation, heaven knows what they must be able to do. Um, the reality is that researchers have a problem communicating and, this, and the, they are not taught how to do this as a, on the whole. They're not educated or supported in communicating with the wider public. But the problem is policymakers are not much better. On the whole, if you look internationally at what policies, uh, have, what's happened with policymaking is that policymaking is done to people. You know, so we have, a, we have an initiative to do with gender in sport. And it's kind of dropped on, on certain cultures, like, a la a, like an atomic bomb. And then they're just expected to deal with it. And that might, that's my worry, if I'm honest, about the Charter. As great as it is, and I really do think it's an excellent piece of work, obviously. Um, but I also I worry if it's just going to be offered or presented as an expectation, without support, without guidance, without cultural context, it won't work. Because we know that these things don't work. But if it's given those things, then I think it's got a decent chance. And then there's the interaction, as I said, get these people in a room and get them talking to each other. I mean, yeah, there's a few problems. I'm not actually going to go through that because we'll save more time for, for talking. So solutions. I said that I've got some solutions to the problem. Um, I lied. Uh, sorry about that. But here's a few vague ideas. This is Chewbacca going for a job interview, um, but unfortunately he can't get the job interview because he's poor communication skills. Chewbacca is, of course, the hairy one. Ah! Um, both policymakers and researchers need to learn to communicate ideas effectively. You know, as the therapists say, the first step to change is to recognise you have a problem. Researchers and policymakers have a problem, it seems to me. Okay. I've gone through the whole of this conference without mentioning Design to Move, so please forgive me, I'll make one mention. Design to Move is a worldwide physical activity agenda funded by Nike. Um, the reason I want to mention it is purely, if you haven't seen Design to Move, please access it. So everything is free off the internet. Uh, it's sponsored by Ixbay and the American College of Sports Medicine and Nike. The reason I really like it is because of the beautiful simplicity of the messaging. The lesson I learned from working on Design to Move was messaging. That's the gap in our skill set. So it's not just about communicating clearly, but it's also phrasing it in ways that are meaningful and engaging to people. And of everything I've seen in physical activity and sport, Design to Move is the nearest I've, I've come across to getting it right. Full disclosure, I did write large parts of it, um, but I didn't write the beautiful, simple clarity. Uh, they actually got somebody else to do that. And aim for in incremental leveraging gains. Personally, I think eating an elephant one, one mouthful at a time is the way ahead for physical activity. I don't think that we're going to get a revolution in physical activity and sport. Uh, I dream of a day where, women, where we have occasional sports where women are coaches or uh, referees. For, but, but sexism and prejudice and, uh, out, and outdated, ignorant attitudes take, unfortunately, change over generational time. Um, I think we need to push and fight. But the whole point about the Archimedial principle is if we can find a point of leverage and a place to stand, you can actually move the world. And heaven knows it needs to move. Thank you very much. Uh, oh, the other third topic I always talk about is Berlin, where I live, is the sexiest city in the world. I'm not commissioned by the Berlin Tourist Board, but if you haven't been, you'd be very welcome. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, we will now go uh, through the charter, uh, every article for, for after article. So we will start with point uh, one, point one. No, I, we won't. Uh, but I, I would actually like to ask uh, a question, and I will, I will open for, for questions very soon. But I would like just to start with, because you come from uh, different parts of the world. Some, um, so, so the f very first article is, 
Our, is physical education, physical activity and sport a fundamental right for all, as, as it stands now? Maybe, Bob? In practice? No. Now you can hear me. Okay, good. Uh, the long answer is yes. And a short explanation. Uh, tied to that to the right is, has to be some kind of responsibility as well. And that's, that's partially what I miss, is that more emphasis on responsibility in the Charter. It talks about sharing responsibilities and it lists about <laughs> 10 different groups, meaning no one uh, is taking any kind of a lead responsibility. Uh, and, uh, and there is a primary responsibility there. 2006, I remember seeing a, a survey on play, you know, and they did a survey of all these youth on play, of what, how they play and what they prefer. And there was this remarkable question about do you prefer to play inside or do you prefer to play outside? And the, one of the surprising answers was this kid wrote, I prefer to play inside. Why? Because that's where the power sockets are. <laughs> yeah. We have a responsibility as well to make sure with the the, the, the quick foods we have and, uh, and we're feeding our children and, uh, and these other distractions that they have. Uh, I think schools, governments and parents have a, should be having more of a responsibility to make sure they exercise their right uh, to sport and physical activity. And I'd like very much uh, that the, the options you were giving, that uh, you make it easier for the for people and make it much more attractive uh, for them to, uh, to exercise their right. You seduce them into exercising their right, which is very good. I, was, I found your presentation very attractive. And thank you. And the next very short question, and also remember short answers to all the short questions, uh, and that is for you. Um, the first charter, it's, not, it's a revised charter. What, what would you say has been the impact of the first one? or the one we have now? That is the one, hello, that is the one tricky question uh, I would like to avoid and uh, I have a personal excuse. I'm actually working in this area since three and a half years and can't tell you much about what the Charter was before, but I will be honest. I think the, uh, and that is very much related to what the Charter is good for. In countries that have a white book, in countries that have uh, specific legislation on uh, access to sport, etc., the Charter may be less relevant, but in the majority of countries we're dealing with in the world, there is no standard for uh, the vision we articulate in the Charter that is much more relevant. And I think in these countries it is vital that these stakeholders, be they public, which they are in most cases because their civil society is not as evolved in many regions in the world as it is in Europe, that public stakeholders and other stakeholders have a reference, have a standard to refer to, have a common vision, which is a sort of official vision. Uh, and I think that was one of the main merits of uh, the Charter before its revision, is it could, be, it could be used to state certain claims that had no other reference in the international agenda. Uh, another point, and I, uh, if you allow, long answer to a short question, because uh, Bob asked a number of questions, and. The first thing is really I want to clarify. I had no personal motivation to embark into the revision of the Charter after having accomplished the Declaration of Berlin. I thought that was it. And now we move on to implementation. But the Charter came across, and I think now uh, it, is, it is a very important document uh, in the context in which we are, we are working. I'd like to join you in Kenya, though, because I think you must have quite some fun uh, after having suffered the UN system. How do we implement? And uh, I'll come back. Uh, how do we use this vision? And there are two main strands I see coming. One is the checklist. There needs to be a global referential, this global baseline. 
Uh, again, I said there is no country in the world that meets all the principles stated in the Charter. And I think we need to use the Charter as creating that baseline as, as the standard for policymaking in sport. And the public authorities in charge of sport in most countries have no other standard. They can't work on Agenda 2020. They can't work on the very well globally organized rules of uh, organized crime, sabotaging sport. All these counter uh, forces to the vision the Charter expresses to sport are organized in some way or another. And we need to oppose to this at least a vision on which we can agree and then try to enforce it. So checklist is number one on the international scale, combined, as, as um, um, <coughs> Richard said, with tools, with help, with assistance uh, to member states uh, in forms of, of uh, guidelines, etc. But not only. I think the most important thing probably is to use the charter at the national levels in certain countries uh, that are seeking to establish their sport policy altogether, including legislation, including the basic uh, infrastructure for sport policy that does not exist in many countries in the world. And this is something uh, I would put as a priority. We have to organize, first of all, a, what we call a structured and informed dialogue amongst the different stakeholders in sport. And in many countries, that would be the vital first step. And this charter can serve as the core agenda. And of course, there is great differences. As much as the Charter is a common denominator, as much a country that is per, uh, primarily pursuing physical activity to fight uh, uh, obesity or to, uh, to fight health issues, has another situation than a country that comes out of a post-crisis situation and needs to, uh, uh, um, uh, to focus on social inclusion of, of marginalized people, etc. So we need to adapt the Charter, we need to test it, in specific national contexts together uh, with uh, different stakeholders. Thank you. Okay, b before, uh, I know, <coughs> uh, is it a specific question to a point in the chart or is it an overall question? Uh, we have down here, uh, you were the first one. Um, yeah. So, so is it, is it a, it's not a specific question to one point, it is a general question. It's both a specific and a okay. general. Is it okay <laughs> if, if I ask uh, one more question then? Be because uh, if we then said that the governments are and all the stakeholders, they said we will use this, we will actually use this and try to implement a lot of the, 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 this, these things and go through it and make policies and funding and all that. Would that be the right paper? Would it be the right or would we actually... If we were Bjorn Lomborg, would we say, but that would be stupid. It would be much better to fight the poverty or the social inequality. And then sports participation would, would, would rise by itself. So we would actually invest in a bad way if we invested in, in this charter. And th maybe th that's a question for, for Mons Kierkeby or, 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 one, or maybe for Richard. It's just th that was just one more introductory question. Because what we see is that normally... Uh, no matter if, it, if it's in Denmark, if, if the, it, it doesn't really matter what the mu municipality does, what's really deciding is the level of education and the level of uh, the socio-economic status of people. So that was one more. There's, uh, as mentioned, the, this is a worldwide, worldwide guideline. And of course, that's very ambitious to think that one guide can guide the world. So of course, there are some social and cultural contexts to take into con consideration. I think uh, those who can use it will use it. It's a platform, it's a hook to get in a dialogue between uh, civil society and the state. Uh, as an interest-based organization, we do not have a duty to consider the holistic uh, policy. Uh, we can, but it's not our duty. Uh, from a human rights perspective, there are duties. Uh, human rights is a duty for the state towards the citizen. They are duty bearer. And as in many declarations, uh, human rights declaration, it says that you have a right to access to sport and physical activity. The state is a duty bearer. But that does, leave, does not leave us innocent. Because we are a moral duty bearer. As, as an NGO, civil society, we are a moral duty bearer. And we will, of course, use this. And I think it's right what uh, Philippe says. It's for, for some countries where there are zero, it's good that the civil servants and the very weak civil society are not starting to invent everything in a policy here as a guideline. They can start with some of it. Whatever they choose to start with, that's up to them. Okay. And then I think I will 
open for questions down here. Have you got the microphone already? I do. Yes, and please state who you are and who you represent. If yeah. uh, My name is Bruce Kidd, uh, and I work at the University of Toronto in Canada. And I, uh, I, I want to commend Philip, uh, your colleagues, and all the many other people who shaped uh, this over the last couple of years, and particularly your uh, executive uh, for standing up to the international sports community uh, and reframing uh, the the uh, the the the, uh, the the landscape of sport uh, and uh, to set out a much more realistic view of the way in which the sport uh, community is embedded in civil society uh, and uh, reject the old idea that sport was somehow uh, autonomous from society. Uh, I would add, um, I would add as as a, a, a veteran. Uh, of the long history of the Charter to what people have said in the last few minutes about its usefulness, um, if this is broadly uh, disseminated. Uh, in the first place, uh, some of the language would be uh, valuable in, in many of the debates we've had uh, at this conference in the last uh, two uh, or three days uh, for the, the process of, uh, of advocacy. And I know myself, in thinking about letters to a new federal government in Canada, uh, how I will uh, both encourage them to ratify it and also to uh, remind them of this standard. But it could be, it, c it should be used by, uh, uh, a for advocacy, for the leverage that Richard called for at every uh, level of, of sport, physical activity, and physical education. Uh, after 1978, uh, the UNESCO Association of Canada printed thousands of copies of that charter and distributed them to all the universities where there are physical education kinesiology programs. And for, for probably 10 years, uh, there, <coughs> there were efforts to, um, to, to not only hand them out, but teach, the, teach about the agenda that they represented and encouraged uh, those students when they graduated to take these ideas forward and, and make them uh, the, the uh, you know, the target for their advocacy. Remember the short okay, uh, okay, well, questions. Uh, and then that ran out of gas. And I would say today very few realize that such a charter exists. And because of the, you know, uh, ethereal nature of discussions of the last few years, that even though that's been revised in the in the in the progressive way, you, I'd say very few people, you know, who are actually working in sport physical education. So the question is, how will you disseminate it? Uh, yeah, you know, that was the question. Uh, I think that's a clear question uh, with the long. Uh, Bef way before we got there, but actually it's, tr it's uh, absolutely true. We, people have to know that it exists, and uh, how will that happen? Uh, first of all, we have a group of core stakeholders which were involved in the revision. That includes uh, some 30 member states, NGOs, researchers, etc. We have sent to them, in, we have solicited these stakeholders in June, about uh, and proposed a list of things they could help us doing with. The feedback was very, very poor. Uh, that is number one. The core stakeholders even have problems in even uh, relating to the promotion of the Charter. Second, we have now some funds from some countries to do the minimum job. I have a website with a Charter. It doesn't exist. You know, the basic UN work. Uh, we will adopt, at the same time as we hopefully adopt the Charter, the, uh, proclaim the International Day of University Sports. Uh, whether that is a good thing or not, uh, I don't want to discuss here. But there's clearly university, sport universities are the first, as you said very rightly, the first network into which the Charter has to be diffused. And we will talk with the FISU and with other partners on how we can ensure the Charter is broadly disseminated. We know that some member states have already reproduced the Charter and uh, disseminated at the national levels. But our, our means are very, very limited. This is, again, a shared task. We have, I think, done a job which was necessary, but it is far from being sufficient. Uh, so we rely, we rely a lot on, uh, on partners which are here and others. Um, this is, at the beginning, we can't really 
offensively promote the Charter before it is adopted. So we are in a, in a difficult situation, and as I said, you never know whether it will be really adopted. I'm hopeful and optimistic it will be, but we are preparing at least a resource kit for our networks, and the partners' networks who have asked us to prepare a boilerplate communication platform we can relay, and that is what we will do over the next weeks, uh, with facts and figures, with quotations of support, etc., uh, that can be used by the partners. This is the first stage. I hope it's not going to be the last one. Thank you. Um, you have a comment? It just to say that in uh, 1978, when the first charter was there, paper was sophisticated means of communication. It's not today. No. Something happens between uh, 78 and today, and to be a little direct and blunt also, Philippe, the connection between a charter and a fee stunt is lacking some strategy. Richard? Yeah, I'll speak just to make sure that my microphone is working. Um, I think a couple of thoughts. So the first is, if you haven't looked at the original charter, do so to realise just how awful it is, um, how dated, how, how uh, as, you know, really women do not appear. I, 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 you, I, I was trying to imagine the scenario because you think, well, it's obviously, you know, the, this is the time of Matthew Arnold, a rugby school or something like this. No, it was the 1970s. And th th clearly they'd had a meeting without women in the room is the only way I can assume this has <coughs> happened. Uh, the language is out of date, the reference to the media is out of date and so on. So obviously for its day it was what it was. So to some extent, even an exercise in updating the language <coughs> would be an improvement on the original document. But actually, the, the document, I think, is, is really progressive. And I, um, and, you know, I really do think it is a, it's a, um, probably the most complete um, document of that sort that I've, I've come across. Um, my view in terms of, of communicating it, I've hinted at already, is you know, policymakers, researchers, government officials are not experts at selling. We have to employ people who's, who, are, who excel at selling. <coughs> so the reason Design to Move is efficient is because Nike's very good at selling trainers or sneakers or whatever you want to call them. And they could use a similar type of logic and a similar type of process. I think we, that we need to, I'm completely aware of the financial situation, but think about the me methods that are used <coughs> by people who sell for a living. Not people like me or Philip who, who kind of we would say box and cox, uh, figure it out as we go along and then say, well, this will probably work. You know, it'll probably be okay, but there are people who excel at these skills. In other words, we have to inv involve the private sector. I don't see there's any alternative to it. Espen, you had a short comment. I think uh, you are just a bit ahead. Uh, in a few years, sponsors and uh, media understands that they shouldn't support Sip Blatter's uh, own company or other people's own company for getting personal financia financial uh, situations. In Denmark, uh, the biggest milk company, Arla, shifted from sponsoring a main uh, team to sponsoring that all children can make healthy food and eat healthy food. It's a much better sponsoring story. You have a much better story than supporting uh, some place soon having a world championship without democracy, without uh, good situations. You have talked about this for the last days. Bring the charter. It's the answer. It's so easy. It's not a debate. You have to use it right now. Nike will come next year. <laughs> they, were invited they, have been, year. they have been invited. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and Richard, you said that uh, you need to bridge the gap between research and, and policies. Yeah. Uh, and uh, we, we, I, I said when we started, there won't be any of, we have lots of brilliant journalists at this conference. They have investigated all the sports organizations and the corruption and all that, but we can't make them investigate if their government or their sports organizations live up to this charter. Would that be helpful if that could be a possibility? Philip, maybe that's for you. Well, I've been working for, uh, my background is marketing and finance. Oh, I apologize. So um, I'm, I'm not, not, <laughs> not selling, not selling. Uh, I ended up in the UN, so that is how far my expertise goes. Um, uh, but I have no illusions about the, uh, the demands of the sellers. And the demands of the sellers will not just to be ha have a nice vision to communicate, it's how we implement and activate the vision. So what we are working is, of course, the first national workshops that will activate the charter. And along these workshops, I'm very hopeful and 
after these workshops that we will find partners who see the relevance of the Charter in practical terms. No uh, private company is yet I'm, I'm very happy that a pragmatician such as you are sees the potential for, for future interest. I do see it as well. I think we have to take the elephant with big bites, but bite by bite. Uh, uh, of course, I'm aware that we don't talk about distributing paper. It's obvious that we, again, you know, this is reality. We have now funds for paying a social media consultant to do the work uh, full time for at least one, uh, one month and a half. That's how we evolve, you know, step by step. Uh, but I'm quite convinced that the values that are stated in the charters are values many stakeholders uh, would like to be associated with. Uh, but we need to give them more reality. It's not just enough to be proud about adopting this document. It is caring about its implementation, and that proof is the next challenge. Yes, and then we'll take some question. Uh, we have one here. Uh, Sven, you look here at the sports markets network. Kesem said what I said earlier, I think, stories. The best way of selling anything in the whole world is by selling stories. Tell if you read the, cha the charter, you will need a degree in applied physics to be able to convert that into <laughs> stories. There's a thing called social media. Out there, there's a wonderful rolling chart of all the tweets, all the rest of it. Uh, you don't need to employ clever consultants. You need to find some 15-year-olds who can engage with 15-year-olds in their language and then up you up and running, guys. And that costs about an ice cream and a pat on the back. That's all we need to do, please. Yes, and I can add that actually we will, uh, at the final dinner, we will actually be, be dancing the charter tonight. <laughs> <laughs> um, Anyone who feel they want to like to ask? I, I, yes, I totally agree. But I'm just slightly cautious about employing child labour, just <laughs> as we're <laughs> trying to advocate uh, human rights. But you're, of course, right. We have a question over here. Um, it's also more of a comment. Jonas Burkheim, um, Sport Cares. Um, I think um, in actually disagreeing to statements from, or a sta earlier statement from the panel, there's a clear duty of stakeholders in um, derived from such documents as well. Um, it's not only states and, and organizations they compose as members, uh, such as UNESCO, but it's, it's stakeholders, um, of course, who, are, who also have a duty to, um, to um, reach back to these kind of um, documents and to implement them. And if that's a question of translating that into practice, Sport is a perfect uh, area for that. Um, I mean, give one of those articles to a number of kids, discuss it with them, and ask him how uh, how they would describe it. Um, uh, get him to um, to do some activity on that, and and I'm sure um, Misa is and and Bob is probably um, uh, considering these kind of things. Um, I would imagine, you know, break it down, do it with them. They are the best, as it was just said, to to transport that. Mm -hmm. um, and then, I mean, one shouldn't expect having worked for you and. Before, um, quite seriously, um, one shouldn't expect that that organization is the one to translate that down to the to those practical levels. Um, it's quite brave to to bring up such a um, document here already, and I think it was a rather quick process. This hasn't been mentioned yet. I think uh, so much um, to get to this charter. So this would be um, uh, my comment. And um, in an ideal world, policy in, is in line with uh, with practical status quo. But I don't think um, that's uh, the case in, in many places. Look at the UN Charter and uh, <laughs> other things. So thank yes, you. Yes, uh, I, I thought that was more like a comment. I don't know if anyone feels like feels attacked up here. No, not really. But we have one question here, and we have there. Afterward. Yeah, Martin Holzweg, Berlin, Germany. I work as a researcher for UP and XP. Uh, I have one question to the speakers on the panel. Um, do you know the initiative of a British bank that uh, has been uh, realized some years ago called Miles Ahead? So, does anybody know this initiative? No. Um, it was an initiative because uh, this bank had several branches in Africa and they thought they might give something back to the continent or the region. So they did a tour from London, I guess, to, uh, to Cape Town. And every country they passed, they did it by car or by these big trucks. And every country they passed, they did an initiative to support the children of that country. And maybe I can 
send you a short email and you, as a kind of homework, answer if it would not be worth doing it. Like a kind of uh, same, same idea or similar idea, but of course not by car, this is out of date. But maybe virtually, in some countries of the world, do something similar and maybe have an initiative in every country or every region, you do something that supports the idea of the charter, namely for physical education, physical activity and sport. And then just gather it, maybe with social media, and present it. Yes, I, I took that as another comment uh, and a proposal to work with. Uh, I don't think you will be opposed to the proposal. Uh, we have a question down there. Um, Laura Robinson from Canada, and I, I did have a copy of the last UNESCO charter, and I, I know that Bruce uh, Kidd gave it to me, and I tried to use it when we were arguing against a big uh, Walmart development uh, in a town that would definitely uh, increase uh, the danger to cyclists and, and to t pedestrians. And our lawyer said to me, don't even think about using it. It has absolutely no legal standing. And I'm afraid that um, I, I, I love, you know, I love the UNESCO Charter, but I'm wondering if anyone could tell us, as we get um, more sort of international law that allows multinational companies like Walmart to just kind of come in everywhere and, you know, uh, just yeah. completely eradicate oh, your area, um, eradicate the, the infrastructure, the play infrastructure in your area, is there a way, can anyone think of a way that we could actually turn good intentions into international law. The Walmart legislation, anyone in for? May I comment on yes. that, uh, being a lawyer? So um, I'm not gonna be able to give you an exact answer because I believe this has more to do with Canadian law than international law. And when it comes to international law, uh, as a lawyer, I, I was, I was thinking rather to be honest or more politically correct, and I'm going to go with the honest. I don't believe international law works at all. I think, and um, unfortunately a lot of my uh, lawyer friends think that international law uh, is lacking the effective sanctioning system. It's working rather in the benefits of the most powerful or more powerful uh, international actors and let that be states, countries in this case, or uh, international companies. So I don't really, unfortunately, personally, maybe other lawyers in the audience would like to uh, disagree with me. I uh, honestly don't see that international law could be used uh, at cases like that. But uh, my belief is that if, in Canadian uh, local government or Canadian uh, state government might be, of course, um, not very willing to take up and m step up on that. But um, if you want to work on these kind of situations, I think it's more to do with the society and then uh, how the society pushes the governments to enact and adopt uh, a legal uh, paperwork that could actually you know be in your benefit so I believe that's the only way it's coming from the society and pushing for their rights and then uh, the politicians decide to step up but other than that international community I don't think it would care much unfortunately thank you and then we, we have to we're moving towards the the end now so I, I would like to and it has to be very short what is from the positions you have what is the best contribution you can give to improve sports physical education, sports participation, maybe using this charter. We start with you, Richard. Well, um, okay, simple messages effectively communicated through multiple means. Um, the other thing I, I did want to say on some of the other points was um, just because uh, an, ev an event happens in a country doesn't mean the people in the country know the event's happening. Um, you know, there's it's very easy to identify a cooperative group that's willing to run an event for you. What the challenge is through things like messaging and communication strategies is to reach the widest possible community. Mons? Yeah, the, uh, uh, the charter, we will of course go through it and see when it's ratified uh, where we can uh, uh, use uh, this as a platform as a hook. I am inspired by Philippe's uh, national workshops. 
But if you have limited resources, take the 50 most uh, needing countries, do the national workshop. We will be happy to do it together with you and with other civil society organizations. And uh, that worked actually uh, in a concept uh, from a Council of Europe uh, 30 years ago in, in another program. So uh, very practical, focus of resources on the, the top or uh, low 50 countries. Mm -hmm. Yes, next. <laughs> Well, I'm going to be, again, skeptical about this, and uh, I apologize for that. Uh, we've been talking about its um, uh, positive uh, possible outcomes, and I personally am very skeptical when it comes to um, uh, charters like UNESCO's or international bodies, because um, I believe there's always, uh, in the end, a um, problem with their enforcement. Uh, ergo, it comes down to the same thing, the state's own will to improve the... Um, improve the status and the, or the participation in physical education, uh, physical activities. So I think it's a, it's a great paper, but I, uh, I'm afraid I view it uh, more of uh, wishful thinking. Esten? Let's grow parking lot day. I don't know if you know it, where you take over the parking lots of Walmart and all the other places for one day and mm. do sports and games there in the name of the charter, of course. Mm. <laughs> Next time in Mathari Valley, because it happens frequently, local leaders start grabbing and developing land that we're using for our playing pitches. We're going to show up and we're going to be flashing the, the charter at them. That's the first point. Second point, uh, one of the disadvantages of coming to play the game is I'm surrounded by disgustingly healthy people all this time. So I realized I have to exercise my fundamental right to sport more often and more intensively. <laughs> As I said, using the charter to stop declaring and issuing charters. It's the core argument we have. It's there. We have a declaration, we have a charter, and now we move on to action and measure it. Yes, and I can say that, that we will also take a look at it uh, after the conference. We don't even care if it's ratified. We will, I think if it, if it isn't, we will just call it the Play the Game Charter. Uh, I think <laughs> we, will, we will take a serious look at what we can do to... Uh, to investigate and communicate and, and ask questions if how this is applied. And uh, by saying that, I also uh, sh uh, close the panel, but I don't close the session because we have uh, uh, Mr. Jens Saya Andersen sitting there looking at, the, at me and I, I just cannot take it anymore. So I will have to let him come here up with the final <coughs> remarks. But before he does that, please give the panel a, a, a big round of applause. I would like to uh, close this session and the whole uh, conference by linking them together uh, with a few uh, subjective uh, remarks. Uh, if I can at all get through this labyrinth of notes, um, uh, that, uh, that is some kind of physical exercise for the eyes at least. Um, there is a time for everything. There is a time for love. There is a time for hate. There is a time to scatter stones. There's a time for uh, collecting stones. Uh, I don't, I'm not going to go deeper into the, uh, uh, the Bible and the uh, beautiful uh, poetry there, but I would see there is a time for charters and there is a time for action. And I don't think either one can really live uh, with the other. We have to think, we have to use language, we have to discuss, but we certainly cannot let it be at that. And um, and uh, uh, I think we may have come to the time where we have to consider also at Play the Game uh, how we can become uh, more activist in certain fields without compromising uh, our ability to act as a forum for open and unprejudiced uh, debate based on evidence. Uh, the old chart, uh, I, oh, I have to declare one thing. Uh, it is very, very, it's probably out of courtesy and so on that my name has been mentioned in relation to the charter. I, I have to distance myself somewhat from it out of vanity because I agree that the language in this charter is certainly not, it's far from my language, it's not for storytelling. And it, uh, we did actually in the process consider whether we should write it all uh, uh, from scratch but the mandate 
from uh, UNESCO was that that was not possible. That was not the process that was started. It was a revision. So what we did, we had to revise it until it was completely in recognizable. Um, but, but the language of such an international paper remained the same, more or less. But I think I have contributed to removing a few of those semicolons that could have occupied the ministers for hours. Um, the reason why I'm personally a little more optimist than, than some uh, with regard to this is that the 1978 uh, charter was surely outdated. I remember my first impression. It, it was idealist, it was visionary, very uh, good for its, ti its time. But just to give you one characterization, uh, there is a, a phrase in it where it says, competitive sport must in no way be influenced by profit-seeking interests. <laughs> we could make that statement again, but it would, I think then we would have some action ahead of us. Um, and that was just uh, uh, one example. Uh, I'm also optimist because I was actually present at uh, the MINEPS 5 conference in Berlin, where I met a number of governmental representatives and sensed the atmosphere in the room. And it was evident that sport politics, from being really an area that no serious politicians would like to be connected with, in sec except when a gold medal should be handed out, was something they discovered, hey, match fixing. Oh, uh, sustainability in big events and abuse of public money, uh, corruption organizations. These issues were all raised, and you could sense that ministers are also persons, and they're also human beings, some of them. And, and they, and they uh, discover things and reflect. And I experienced in another context at the Council of Europe Ministers Conference uh, last year, many of these ministers are genuinely unsure about what they can allow themselves in terms of regulating sport. And that is why these discussions and conferences can have an impact. There's also another uh, reason that I have to mention uh, that toned down my role. Actually, the basic work in the revision was done by Richard Bailey on behalf of Ixpe, who is uh, sitting there. So it's it's all a very, very big come together. There were consultative meetings, numerous organizations, all knowing what to throw into the charter. And it, the only thing that D Philip and I had the pleasure of sp spending two days together in his modest office in, in Paris, uh, pull down the curtains and write and write and write. And I hope his desk is now less messy than it was at the time. Um, but this lead, I would say, though, there is on one point where I uh, inadvertently became involved in what proved to be big politics, which was, I have to say, a big surprise for me. Um, at a meeting among the, the group of countries, the sort of CGEPs countries, there's a lot of acronyms in this world, in January, held at the Olympic uh, headquarters in Lausanne, we had a discussion of precisely uh, the issue that uh, Philip mentioned, uh, the autonomy of sport, because the host, the International Olympic Committee, wanted to have the same phrase established as Jonas Berkheim earlier in his lecture referred to. They wanted to have the, dra the, the charter to confirm that the, there is autonomy of sport and that the IOC is the leader of the Olympic movement and the sports movement. I protested cautiously because I said, I don't think autonomy of sport is a healthy notion for several reasons. Partly, it has been abused over the years as a shield for malpractices and outright corruption. That's one thing. Another reason is sports organizations do not respect the autonomy of sport. They ask questions in democratic countries whenever a government wants to uh, uh, regulate sport, perhaps to avoid corruption, then they defend the Olympic family. They never ask questions about autonomy of sport in China, in Azerbaijan, where the president is also head of the NOC, as we heard, in uh, Russia, the sports minister of Russia, is also now pre elected president of the Russian Football Federation, and he is a member of FIFA's executive committee. I haven't 
heard FIFA threaten Russia with a boycott. They have threatened many other countries for much less. These are just some, you can take the Arab countries, a number of African countries where state and sport is one. So as long as the sports organizations do not uh, respect their own autonomy, I don't see any reasons why governments should. But I thought that we should reintroduce or remind everybody about the notion freedom of association. Because as long as sport is association-based and belonging to civil society, not for profit and not collecting profits, then we should be very, very careful that the uh, autonomy of association, the freedom of associations is respected. As soon as it becomes business, then it must be into the business registers and abiding all kind of law. It, sport always said, oh yeah, we want to abide by the law, and that's very easily said when it's regulated by law of association, for associations, because then there are almost no regulations. Also, it's important to stress that sport is not a special association activity. Like, it, it has no uh, privilege if you collect with stamp collectors, if there are any stamps left, uh, soon we will probably have, have uh, SD cards, memory card collectors. That, like all these associations for, for rabbit breeders and so on, they have, they are, uh, have exactly the same freedom of association. And there's one more point to it. Not only that the state should not interfere, but that citizens are free to act and form associations and assembly, that is a sound notion and it's an established human right. This also means that you can use your freedom of association to break out of your sports club, your sports federation, or your international federation if you're unhappy with the way it's run. And this is a movement that Henrik and others have documented over the past days in the Eden Forum and in other contexts where we see People act without studying charters or uh, without uh, de debating FIFA. They, they act on their own in order to pursue their own uh, happiness uh, through physical activity. And that is another very important, and I'm sorry that it is going in, this is going into a probably very boring lecture uh, about freedom of association, but it is deeply connected to what we started this conference with. You heard two interpretations of the autonomy of sport. You heard the, an employee of the IOC who has, who has to reflect the official viewpoint of the IOC saying sports autonomy is a must. And you had the doyen, the longest serving IOC member at the opening ceremony say there are few notions so antiquated as the autonomy of sport. Get rid of it. That leaves some room for discussion, also internally at the IOC. But what happened back in Lausanne, because I digressed from that, was there was an immediate response from the IOC president to the UN Secretary General. They had a meeting the next week, and then they tried to reintroduce the autonomy of sport uh, uh, in and if, uh, some people drafted a very, very good um, uh, the suggestion, good compromise, but then the UNESCO rejected it. Uh, my big, uh, say, ten, or the, what I look very much forward to in the general UNESCO General Conference is to see, will there be a last minute introduction of the autonomy of sport? Because it matters, I think this charter uh, matters. It matters because governments can actually get inspired. Get inspired. It matters because in those countries where the governments are not inspired by this charter, activists like Laura and uh, Hande can take this charter and say, hey, you signed this. You, you made a compromise. It matters also because we see that the international federations are not they are part of the problem. The federation system is simply not up to the tasks that it says it, they say they are up to. And that's okay if they don't want to limit other people, then we have uh, numerous other stakeholders. But of course, there's also 
one matter, we should not only ask the IFs, we should not only ask other stakeholders, we should, as Jürgen Grisbeck said yesterday, ask, what does it look like when we look at ourselves? And I can only speak for play the game. I think it was very, very good that Mons mentioned, uh, brought an elephant into the room. Um, I think we have come to a time where it's evident that we need still to be a home for the homeless questions in sport. There are still homeless questions around. But we have also, as we have tried through many years, try to make this forum a forum where we develop solutions. And that is much harder. And we may even, and this is something we have to evolve over uh, the time to come and we need your, well, uh, and we need your help, we may even uh, find out if we can make some actions that have real consequence, immediate consequence uh, in real life. But we need also to have, uh, you ha need to have a little patience with us. We are, as I said, as a conference, as I said at the opening, we are dependent on you. We, your input, your, uh, the way, your suggestions for how we improve this forum, how we can develop it. We had this year 180 something, uh, I don't think we finished counting, but 185 uh, presentations made by 163 speakers. It is growing. It is not an end in itself that we become bigger because we also want to be better, but it certainly is my impression that we have had a conference that completely met the very high expectations that we at organizers have, and that is uh, something that we, will, that we will take away as a relief, but also as a very big satisfaction that you can keep up the buzz and the contributions that we are completely dependent upon. That uh, is very, very rewarding, and for that I want to thank you. I think uh, that should, that was more than enough as a closing. We have something much more important in front of us. At 8 o'clock we will meet for a cocktail, and uh, I hope all of you, plus all those who are taking a nap right now, will be ready for a great party tonight. Um, we think we have, at least momentarily, something to celebrate. Uh, that's also a kind of action. And then we will uh, continue our uh, involvement, revolu reform or revolution tomorrow. Thank you.